thank you all for joining me on um, on this fine and uh, sunny Thursday uh, morning. Um, thanks to Rachel and Claire and Joe for setting it up um, uh, from the Council for British Archaeology. The first thing that I want to do is remind you that if you have any questions as I'm talking, um, do put them into the Q&A um, a little box at the bottom of the zoom and you can type it in type in the question and then we'll have them all in a list so we can make sure we don't miss any at the end and then the other thing is um, i'm going to do a couple not loads but a couple of little polls so to get us started so that you're um you know you've got your fingers you're typing and fingers and your thinking brains ready um i'm gonna set our first poll which is a bit of a silly one but you'll enjoy it okay launch poll How's your morning going? Okay, so each of you vote uh, great, terrible, or somewhere in the middle. I uh, cannot vote, but I'm gonna tell you that my morning is going pretty great, partly because I'm here chatting to you guys, which is awesome. It feels very privileged. All right, I'll give you wah, five more seconds to vote. 24, I don't know, let's go 30 seconds, there we go. I think we're in, we're in, we're in, we're in, 100% voted, look at that. End of the poll, share results. So great, even though it's in red, 70% great, 30% somewhere in the middle, and happily, no one is having a terrible morning, which makes me happy, good. So that is how the polls work, and I've got a couple of other polls um, uh, further into the talk, but first of all, before we get to them, I'm gonna show you some pictures. So what I'm gonna do is share my screen, um, share it, there we go. Right, let's start from the current slide. So um, I'm, uh, I studied archeology span and anthropology at uni, and I've had, loads of really amazing opportunities to work with professional archaeologists and amateur archaeologists and volunteers in groups um, all across the world and all across Britain and I'm super privileged to have had that opportunity so here's me diving a shipwreck off the Isles of Scilly it's called the HMS Colossus and it was wrecked it's a Napoleonic era ship so from um, the end of the 1700s start of the 1800s and the big sticky uppy spiky things that you can see that I'm shining my torch on, they're actually the copper rivets that originally held the, the pieces of timber that were the hull of the ship. And so when the ship sunk, it broke up into two and then landed in this quite shallow water. It was during a storm. Um, and the, a lot of the timber has obviously rotted away because it's been lying on the seabed for, for 200 years. Um, but the copper rivets are exactly where they were when the, this massive ship landed um, on the, the seabed. And so um, there are professional archaeologists and a local volunteer group who regularly dive the site to check on how it is to um, record the location of both artefacts and these different aspects of the ship, which was amazing. I must admit, I hadn't quite realised you could do so much cool archaeology underwater, but it turns out you can. Um, I've also had the chance to travel pretty widely, which has been super awesome. Um, this is Petra in Jordan, and um, when we get through COVID and life returns to normal, if you ever get a chance to go to Jordan, I would say it's a brilliant place to visit because there are so many interesting archaeological sites to explore. Um, recent ones around the First and Second World Wars, but also very ancient ones. These are rock cut tombs. You can see the, the little square shapes, the little doorways in the, um, in the sandstone cliffs behind me. Um, they are all uh, tombs um, that were used um, in uh, about three, oh gosh, I can't remember the, the date now. Oh, shame on me. Um, I'll get back to you because it's totally gone out of my mind, the date of these caves. If someone knows, put it in the chat, that would be cool. Uh, so that the caves at Petra, um, they've also found Neolithic evidence. Um, so much, much earlier, earlier than the British Neolithic. Um, so this site has been used for a very, very long time and it's very cool to explore. 
And I also uh, quite recently went to Tibet. Now, Tibet has really interesting archaeology. It's, it's sometimes known as the roof of the world because it's uh, so high up the altitude. Um, when you fly in, it's about 4,000 metres. And so you, f just under 4,000, about 3,600 metres. So you feel quite breathless. Some of you will have seen um, images of mountaineers climbing up something like um, uh, Mount Everest, where they're using oxygen because the air is so thin because they're so high up. Um, above 8,000 metres, you end up um, really struggling for, to, to breathe as, as soon as you exert yourself. And uh, in Tibet, you get a little bit of that. So people can get this um, thing called altitude sickness where they, they don't feel well. Now, the thing about um, the creatures here, uh, these are yaks. Uh, yaks, uh, which seems entirely appropriate given I'm talking to a whole bunch of yakas. Um, and this lady here, whose name is um, uh, Sonam Shudru, um, she farms these yaks. And the way that she farms the yaks is very similar to the way that people were farming yaks when they first started farming yaks in Tibet um, about 3,000 years ago. And the yaks are really amazingly adapted to this high altitude um, environment. So they can actually, their lungs are more efficient than um, bovines so cows and things like that that don't live in this high altitude environment and they have a different kind of blood well they, they've got more um uh red blood cells so they their bodies are better at using the oxygen that is in the air even though the air is much thinner and i thought i put some extra pictures of yaks in because you are the yak so here's a yak and they during the summer months which is when i went to visit them um filming for the discovery channel uh, they they milk the yaks three times a day because each time you milk a yak by hand, you don't get loads and loads of milk, but they keep producing it because they've got their little yak babies. Um, so the yak babies drink the milk in between and then Sonam Shudru um, milks the yaks uh, three times a day. So one at about 7 a.m. just as it's getting light and then one about 2 p.m. And then one, they wait and they milk the yaks in the middle of the night, about 2 a.m. So Sonam Shudru, I was staying over with them in, in, a, in, in their tent, which they, they move because they're moving with the yaks as they go to different pasture, pasture lands in the summer. Um, she, um, she woke me up at 2 a.m. So I get up, got up, it's time to, to milk the yaks. Now she was speaking uh, Tibetan and I don't speak Tibetan, but I kind of understood why she was waking me up. I understood. Um, and during the day we had a translator, but during the night it was just me because I was staying with them. And uh, all the rest of the TV crew went back to the hotel in the town, which was about an hour's drive away. And I was like, yeah, we'll be fine. We'll work it out. You know, you can, uh, you know, I kind of know which end of the yak I need to milk. So, and I got moderately good. At milking a yak compared to a total beginner but Sonam Shudru was at 2 a.m like mm, come on you need to speed this up a bit because I want to go back to bed so each night for the whole of the summer they wake up in the middle of the night to milk all the yaks and then um, go back to sleep in order to wake up again three hours later to milk the yaks again and they make um, this kind of well it's tasty yak milk it's quite rich it's quite salty it tastes um, different to cow's milk definitely um, and they uh, make a, a kind of a yak milk cheese and then they dry it, they stretch it. So it's like mozzarella a bit, like sort of um, stretchy cheese. And then they dry it into these big kind of tongue shaped pieces of cheese. And I reckon, archaeologically speaking, that cheese is going to last for a long time because it's chewy, that's for sure. The thing that I liked about, um, this is Sonam Shudri's daughter, sitting on a, a bull yak and I said to her wow I didn't realize you could sit on a bull yak without it throwing you off in a fit of anger because bull yaks are quite big and uh, a bit like bull cows you know they can get feisty and you need to be careful around them and then um, she said oh no I'm the only person who'd be able to do this because I raised it when it was a calf um so that is the end of your yak pictures yak fans um uh, I was just chatting to Rachel and Claire before the start of the talk and we were saying that maybe you should adopt yak, a yak as your um, brand uh, with a handprint, a handprint and a yak maybe. I don't know, you can work on it. 
Okay, so uh, you might also know me from TV shows um, about archaeology, like Time Team. I did a series of Time Team with Phil and Mick and Tony and John Gator, who does Geo Geophys, and Alex Langlands as well, you might have come across, which was awesome because I spent the whole summer um, looking at different pieces of archaeology. But this wasn't my first experience in archaeology. Um, my first experience... Um, my first experience in doing archaeology was um, as when I was 18, I finished my A-levels and uh, I was going to university to study archaeology and I got a place as a volunteer on a, um, I got my place uh, as a volunteer on a dig in Cheshire, which is where I was uh, living, growing up with my family. And uh, it was on a site called Poulton, which you might have heard of because they are still excavating it now. Um, when I was there, we were doing the first level of excavation in a field um, where they thought there was a medieval chapel. And the clue was that the field was called Chapel Field. So this was my first experience of archaeology, and it was that realisation that archaeologists are like detectives. You use all the different sources of evidence that you can, and you draw from the landscape, you draw from historical documents, and then you go and find the real, um, the real world evidence to test the theories that you have about the date of a site, um, how, it, how it developed, how people lived there, how they used different tools and artefacts, and then what happened to it afterwards so that it's ended up in the archaeological context that it's in. And obviously for you guys to be part of the Young Archaeologists Club, you are, you still, you all have that the detective mindset of trying to puzzle out questions about the past. And I think it's, it's thoroughly fascinating. And I absolutely love archaeology for that reason, because you get to be a detective of the past and about people's past lives. And it was absolutely true of the experience at Poulton. Um, the people who were running the dig uh, showed me how to do um, basic ex excavation with a trowel and how to record what I was, what I was excavating. And then on the second week, they said, oh, you've been doing, you've been doing okay. You've been working quite hard at excavating what was turned out to be a ditch, um, which was archaeologically interesting, but in the minute by minute revelations, not so interesting because there wasn't anything in the ditch, um, apart from like old medieval mud. What can you do? Sometimes that is the, the essence of archaeology. Um, and they said, you, you've done, if you if you want to you can start helping to excavate this skeleton because what we'd done it turns out the ditch that i had been excavating was a ditch around the boundaries of where the chapel had been and most of the stone had been taken away and reused in other buildings um many hundreds of years ago but the bodies of the people who'd been buried in the chapel graveyard all around the foundations of this building hadn't been disturbed. They'd been left to rest in peace until we turned up. And I realised that we were going to excavate a medieval skeleton. And the medieval skeletons ranged from the um, uh, 1300s through about the 1500s. So this, this site had been used quite, quite, uh, for quite a long time. And I started to excavate and the person that I was working with knew uh, a lot about how to assess and analyse human bones. And they said, oh, you know, this is a, a man's skeleton. You can tell from the shape of the forehead and the brow ridges and the shape of the pelvis as well. And look, he's quite tall. And as we were excavating the bones really carefully, just um, just kind of teasing away the soil from these bones, it started to reveal not only his skeleton, but the story of who he was. And the thing that really struck me was that he had broken a finger. And you could see it because his hands were laid, you know, you must have seen them um, skeletal hands. Um, but this finger was like bent like that. So the other, the bones, this bone had fused. I'll do it, show you that way. This bone here had fused into a kind of hook because this joint had broken and then the way it had um, healed up together um, meant that he had kind of had this kind of gnarly finger for the rest of his life. And they said, oh, it's healed very well. So he must have broken his finger when, I don't know, when he was kind of a young man perhaps, but he's died when he was about 60. So he, he kind of lived a, a decent life as a medieval farmer. 
And the thing about this broken finger, it, it made my imagination run because I thought not only is this a skeleton, a, a particular individual, but this evidence tells a story about how people were living in medieval Cheshire. It tells people, it tells us a story about how, what people believed and that they were being buried east to west um, near, next to a, a Christian chapel. But it also tells a story about, you know, how did he break his finger? What was he doing? Did he get, did he trip over? Did he trap it in a door? Was he, did he have a farming accident? Maybe he had a fight with someone? And all the possibilities, all the human possibilities about this man with his broken finger were there for us to explore and to excavate and find out more. And the amazing thing about Poulton is that by the end of that digging season, not only had we identified the medieval chapel and started to excavate many of the medieval graves and build a picture of the population who had been living in this site, but they've carried on excavating because towards the end of it, they started to find Roman things. And in some of the, um, the, the fill of the grave, so the soil that has been put back into the grave after someone's been buried, they'd found little pieces of flint tools from um, the Neolithic and the Mesolithic. So the Neolithic, the late um, Stone Age, um, about 4000 BC to about 2500 ish BC and the Mesolithic, which is when people were hunter gatherers coming just after the end of the Ice Age, when Britain was first um, habitable permanently. And people would walked across what is now the English Channel from what is now the Netherlands and France, um, and they walked across um, and settled in, in Britain, and they were hunting and gathering rather than farming. And they used flint tools as well as bone and, and wood and antler as well. But the flint tools tend to survive better than, than um, all the organic materials. And so what they'd done was um, those flint tools had been scattered about, just left for thousands of years since they were first dropped by someone in the Mesolithic in, I don't know, 6000 BC. But then when the medieval people were building their chapel and burying their loved ones in this graveyard, when they were shoveling the soil in, sometimes they would incorporate a very ancient um, tool that they probably didn't even notice because they were thinking about, you know, burying their, their loved ones. Um, and so it, for the archaeologists, it meant that they said, hang on a minute, okay, if we're finding Mesolithic and Neolithic flints, in the fill of the grave that means that around here this area would have been used by people because otherwise how how on earth are the flints here they haven't been put here intentionally and so the story of Poulton suddenly extended so much into the past because we were looking at a medieval site and they found some Roman artifacts and then they found Iron Age artifacts going back in time to 800 BC to the Roman invasion at 43 AD, back in time to the Bronze Age, to the Neolithic, to the Mesolithic and then they even found Paleolithic um, artifacts and bones from rhino, woolly rhino and mammoth. So proper Ice Age animals that were roaming across what is now um, the plains of Cheshire near Chester, um, but also still used in medieval times. And um, I, this came through the door just not long ago, uh, current archaeology. I don't know if any of you get this magazine or if your families get this magazine, but there's um, an article about Poulton and um, some of the... Um, should I hold that up? Can you see? Uh, some of the um, animal artefacts and some of the Roman uh, pottery and um, they found evidence for Iron Age houses as well and so they built a, a replica of the Iron Age house. So this pretty random field in Cheshire that I excavated 21, well helped excavate, very much helped a tiny bit, um, helped excavate 21 years ago is still giving up new stories which is absolutely amazing and I think they've still got new stuff to find which is cool and there are digs like that and projects like that all across the country and obviously some of some of you guys um have been involved in them and i think it's it's super cool that um like really passionate young people are in, interested and involved with archaeology because the, the skills that you learn and the way of thinking about the world that you're learning through doing projects and activities with yak will stand you in really good stead for the future right let me show you more things I'm going to show you more things. So that was my first experience of, of archaeology in the field. 
Um, but uh, let me share this. Um, since then, I've done loads of cool um, other archaeological projects. Um, I'm currently working on a series called Mystic Britain. And in each episode, we sort of try to puzzle out uh, a, a mystery from the past. And this is um, the Historic England um, uh, repository for bones, which is down in Portsmouth. And I'm looking at the skull that was discovered, one of the skulls that was discovered at Warren Percy in uh, North Yorkshire. And it's a deserted um, medieval village that you can go and explore. It's a, it's a site that, that you can go and see now. And you can see the layout of uh, where the, the buildings used to be. You can walk down a lane that um, was first used in prehistoric times and then carried on being used by uh, people throughout the medieval period. Um, but one of the excavations that had been done um, a couple of decades ago uh, of the, one of the yards outside one of the houses, they found um, a kind of stash of human bones. And they thought, oh, this is strange. This, maybe this is old bones that medieval farmers found and they didn't, you know, they wanted to be respectful of the human bones. And so they just put them all together in this pit and then buried them over. And then um, the, the, bone specialist, the osteoarchaeologists at Historic England, uh, one of the, the chaps, um, started to look at these bones and he went, hang on a minute, these, these aren't Roman bones, these are medieval bones and they've all got funny marks on them. And the marks that they had on them were cut marks and filleting marks. So it looked like they'd been done with knives and it appeared that they, the flesh had been cut off the bones. And then there were little patches with burning on them. And he said, what is this? Because it's, it's not like a normal cremation. It's, um, it's very unusual. Why would, they have, why would medieval people have done this to more recently buried bones and somehow dug them up and then cut some of the flesh off and then reburied them in a pit in the backyard? Is it a murderer? And it, uh, he said, no, probably not. And then they did radiocarbon dating and they decided that it was definitely not a murderer because these bones appear to date from um, across about 250 years. So if it was a murderer, it would have to be some kind of living dead vampire murderer who never died themselves. And that is unlikely. The current theory that they're working on to explain these strange cut marks on these bones and why they're not in the churchyard or buried somewhere else in the in the normal fashion but they they were found in this funny pit in in the backyard of someone's farmhouse um is because people might have been worried that some of their uh, some of the the bodies in the churchyard might rise up out of the graves like vampires and come back to haunt them and so if they were particularly worried about a particular burial, they would sometimes, apparently, come and dig them up and then sort of chop them up a bit so that they wouldn't be able to come kind of come back like zombies. True story. So it's weird, but, but that is genuinely the, uh, the current working theory for the, um, the revenant burials of Warren Percy. Um, also, slightly less macabre, I realise I'm talking a lot about dead bodies. Um, this is a Mesolithic hut. So this is a replica of a, probably one of the first houses ever made in Britain. So this dates from, uh, this is from Star Car, um, oh, weirdly, again in North Yorkshire, uh, which is a, a site that you might, um, you might be familiar with because it's also where they found deer antler headdresses, these little front parts of a deer's skull and the antlers that have had holes drilled into them. Um, oh, I've got it in my book, hang on. Let me show you a picture. Uh, if I can find it, how done. Where would it be? Somewhere here. Oh, can't find it. Is it here? Oh yeah, there, look. So these are the deer antler headdresses that they found in Star Car, and they date to about um, 9,000 BC. 
which is super old, between 8,300 and 9,000 BC. Um, and the reason they've survived is because they were in really waterlogged um, land on what was once the edges of a lake. And so all this organic material that would normally get rotted down um, has survived. And the reason they found evidence for these little houses, they think, is because they found post holes and then a flat, smoothed area. So they're like, oh, that looks like a hut circle. And so this chap is actually from uh, the Netherlands. I've forgotten his name. Um, and he's a specialist in doing experimental archaeology. And they use the exact same tools and the resources that they would have had available on the site from that period. And he built this really cool, it's sort of like a shaggy teepee. So it's thatched all the way down with this little arched, um, arched door. And that would keep out the Ice Age chill on the edges of a lake. Um, and it was very beautiful. It was very beautiful and quite comfortable in there. I, uh, after we finished filming, I sat and ate my sandwich inside the Mesolithic hut. And it was, um, it was, quite, it was quite a nice place for a picnic. And here I am, dressed up as Boudicca, because why not? Um, so we, we did another episode of, of Mystic Britain, uh, looking at, at, at the, the kind of the, the, the timeline and what happened to Boudicca. So after the Romans invaded in the year 43, Boudicca, who was the queen of the Iceni, who were the tribe living in Nor what is now Norfolk, um, they were... She was, um, uh, her husband died and then the Romans took all their land and um, uh, harmed her and her daughters and she rose up. They thought that that was going to be it, that she was going to be kind of just go away and stop causing trouble. But she rose up and she started a rebellion um, from all the, the, many of the native people who were already living in Britain, the tribal people of the Iron Age, um, against the Roman army. And they marched, they, they destroyed Colchester, what is now Colchester, they destroyed what is London, they destroyed St Albans, and then they started marching north to a place that we think is possibly where this final battle was held. Um, so we're standing in a field near Mansetter um, in the Midlands and um, this chap was dressed uh, in, in the kind of the, the replica but authentic um, garb of, of what a Roman soldier would wear when they were fighting in, in Britain, in Britannia. And um, I'm wearing what possibly looks like a picnic blanket, but again, sort of potentially is, is what a uh, Boudicca would look like. So um, much more organic fa fabrics, um, none of this fancy uh, Roman chain mail and the Romans with their, their kind of um, uh, much more um, standardized weapons and shields and systems of fighting that they would build a shield wall and then they would stab through with their short swords whereas the iron age people weren't used to they weren't a professional army they just gathered up because they were so angry about how the romans were treating them um, and unfortunately well unfortunately or fortunately depending on which side of history you want to fall on um Boudicca and her army were um defeated and we don't actually know where Boudicca ended up because we don't have any written records from the Iron Age people themselves. We only have written records from the Roman historians who were writing about what happened. And they were writing, um, they weren't eyewitness accounts, they were writing much later. And often with these kinds of historical accounts, what you end up with is the Romans going, oh, well, it was a very good battle and we were very, very good. Oh, the, uh, the, 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 the people we were trying to beat. Now they'll go one of two ways. One, they'll either say they were very fierce, but we were better. Or they'll go, they were like animals and they were absolutely nothing to worry about whatsoever. But either way, you have to be a little bit suspicious, a bit cynical perhaps about those historical sources, because as you know, with history, it's written by other people and other people have their own agendas, their own ideas. They have a particular story that they want to tell. So they say, there's two Roman writers um, who write about what happened to Boudicca at the end of this battle. And one of them says that she, um, she drank poison because she was humiliated in the defeat. And then another one says that she um, uh, went away with her wounds. The kind of suggestion being that she was mortally wounded, but then she was taken away, away from the battlefield, but then died somewhere else. 
but we have never found any burial site that might be Boudicca. Um, I mean, maybe we'll never find it. Maybe she was never buried um, or it's out there waiting to be found. Um, more recently, I've, uh, I've done some really cool excavation and this is the next poll that um, I want to ask you. How do I, um, I'm going to, if I click on that, oh no, not that, Marianne. Do I stop? Okay, so have a look at this, um, have a look at this uh, pin because um, I want you to have a look at it and then I'm going to ask you a poll. So how old do you think this pin is? It's made of bone and you can sort of tell from the size of my head how long it is. And I'm going to give you some clues. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to do my next poll. Okay. Ready? How old do you think that poll, um, that pin is? Um, so I've given you four options, modern, kind of, you know, recent, uh, let's say um, 1800s, uh, 1900s or more recent, medieval, um, Roman, so AD 43 to about 400-ish, or prehistoric. So it's a bone pin, probably made from cow bone. And I'll let you um, give you another 10 seconds to vote. Oh, medieval, Rome, Roman, prehistoric, medieval. No one's saying modern. Yeah, it would be kind of a strange, anachronistic, vintage bone pin, wouldn't it? If, uh, if, uh, if it were modern. I just bought it down, accessorised the other day. I didn't. I didn't. I found it in a ditch. Another ditch. Archaeology. There's a lot of ditches in archaeology, isn't there? OK, 100% voted. Let me share with you the results. So, oh, it's a close one. 52% of you say prehistoric. 41% of you say medieval. 7% of you, that's two of you, say Roman. Let's... Uh, um, let me share my screen with you so you can see this um, pin again. It is, in fact, well done, the two of you who voted. It is Roman. It's Roman. And it's from a site called Chester Farm in Northamptonshire, which I um, went to help, not doing a TV show, just helping as a, a volunteer on their archaeological um, excavation. And it was indeed. They said, oh, could, could you help? excavate part of this ditch and I thought oh I always get ditches don't I except when I got that medieval skeleton um and then there in the ditch in the mud uh was this Roman pin it's Roman so this site is really cool it's called Chester Farm and um it's near Urchester and it's on on the the banks of a, a river called the River Neen and it's a place where you can cross the river and again, they found um, evidence from all different eras. Um, but the thing that's really cool is um, in the Roman times, it was probably a little small walled town that was used as a stopover point, a kind of premier inn for um, Roman um, messengers. So they were carrying the imperial post and they would stop at what is now Chester Farm, um, Urchester, to uh, have a rest, have something to eat, sleep if it was the night time, and then change horses so they could carry on cantering northwards from St Albans up towards Kettering. And uh, Chester Farm has uh, revealed all sorts of interesting things because now it's, uh, it's um, farmland next to what was a kind of traditional 17th century set of farm buildings. They found lots and lots of really cool Roman evidence. And the chap next to me found this really ace bit of Roman pottery, which is cool. So it was a good ditch. It was a really good ditch. Um, turns out people throwing rubbish in ditches. I mean, we, we disapprove of it now because so much of our rubbish is plastic and it degrades and destroys the environment. Um, but when, when you're Roman and you drop your hairpin in the ditch or you break the, the pot when you were making a supper, chuck it in the ditch. And, um, and then uh, me or this guy called Mike might find it. Or in fact, you, who knows? Um, I'm going to whiz through the next couple of slides because there was one more um, archaeological adventure that I wanted to talk to you about and that was going to the Simpson Desert in Australia. 
I travelled with um, an expedition team and 17 camels who carried all our kit and there's no standing water in the desert so we had to carry all our water and food and then camping equipment and those are the two of the camels um, jumper is the orangey one standing up and this one uh, sitting down at the front he's called a TC top camel because he was or tall camel depending he was both tall and top because he was the leader and this one is called Roger you say I've given you yaks but I also wanted to give you a bit of camels this is Roger he'd lie down at the end of the day with his head stretched out so that you could stroke his head like a dog it was cute um, and we saw really amazing uh, wildlife as well. So stick insects and crickets. This is called a fat tailed lizard because it's got a fat tail. And this is a spinifex hopping mouse. Can you see how big its feet are? It sort of bounces, which was pretty cool. And we were putting a pitfall trap. So the guy holding it, holding this little mouse is um, called Max Tischler. And he's a, he's a biologist. But this was a mixed expedition team. So the archaeologists, there were botanists looking at the plants and then um, Max, who was looking at the, uh, the, the mammals, because it's also a way of, of learning about the environment and the history of the environment. But what I was particularly interested in was uh, this is the expedition leader, a guy called Andrew Harper. He's excavating a stone tool. There's no naturally occurring stone in the Simpson desert it's a sand desert but we found this amazing grindstone it's massive and it would have been brought into the desert carried on on someone's back or in their arms um, by members of the Wankanaru tribe who used to live in this part of the desert and there's no one who lives permanently in the desert now people live in the towns around the outsides of the Simpson desert and they only go in in um, in winter periods or wet wet seasons but um, until about 200 years ago people were living permanently in the desert and they had this amazing knowledge of how to use the natural resources but they would never be able to find stone and so they had to bring stone in and then they would stash their grindstones so that they could use them to grind seed or grain that they would find and harvest naturally um, and it was an amazing experience because it was a totally unfamiliar environment for me um, but the experts who were around me were able to pull out the evidence of, of how the Wankanura might have been using these environments um, one of the botanists a guy called um, uh, Billy um, and a, a lady called Jen were looking at this plant particularly uh, which is called pituri and it's um it's a little bit like apparently if you dry the leaves and then you ferment them for a while and then you dry them again and then you um either smoke them or chew them um they can make you feel really giddy and silly a bit like you're drunk and apparently um the wankanaro people like to use pituri and grow it so they would cultivate these natural stands of pituri um, but they would also trade it so by tracking where this pituri was growing and knowing where the trade routes across Australia were before um, white people turned up um, the the archaeologists in Australia are being able to plot the networks of trade and exchange and how ideas and people were moving across these vast um, desert areas that otherwise you might go oh there's nothing there except for kangaroos um, no, the people who uh, have been living in Australia from about 40,000 years ago um, knew how to use this environment and it's actually a, a human landscape as well as a, a, an amazing natural landscape. So that was a real privilege to be able to l learn a little bit about the archaeology of, uh, of the desert in Australia. Um, that is an aerial photograph of uh, of the um the sand dunes that we were walking across we were out for 40 days so a bit biblical uh, it was a really really good trip quite smelly we really smelled by the end of it it was pretty stinky yeah but uh you know what can you do okay so i'm going to quickly talk to you about my new book i want to talk to you about three different artifacts from this that's the last thing that i want to do um it's called secret britain and in it i picked a bunch of artifacts from around the country and sites that have always fascinated me and some of them are pretty well known like Stonehenge um, and some of them are probably not as well known 
like um no oh, maybe grimes graves you guys i mean you guys probably know a lot of this stuff because you're in the you're in the business for it but or for example roman face pots from colchester or this is a a seal matrix that was found by a metal detectorist in norfolk um, and it probably dates from ad 600 so early medieval and it's a, a picture of a lady and a man under a cross um, and they think it belonged to a, a queen called queen baldahildis or balthild that's not what i was going to talk to you about let me um get out of the screen share from it oh no hang on no we're going to do this that's what we're going to do. I want to talk to you about one of the things that I did actually mention in the blurb for this talk, which is this amazing skull from Cheddar Gorge in Somerset. It dates to about 12,700 BC. So it's the Iron Age, uh, Iron Age, the Ice Age. Come on, Mary, keep up. It's the Ice Age. And it doesn't look like much, does it? But a bunch of researchers, archaeologists and um, people who specialise in microscopic analysis of bone have identified that this skull was intentionally defleshed and chipped away so that it made a cup. So this isn't just a random bit of like dead person's head that someone found. They have intentionally carved and like cleaned off the, the flesh and then scooped out the innards brains and then used it and cleaned it to use as a cup and they've they've tried to smooth the edges so my question to you my good friends is would you drink out of a human skull now we don't know why people would drinking out of this human skull and we don't actually know what they were drinking but the thinking is and this is again it's an open-ended question um that maybe it was some kind of honor so it wasn't like a gruesome really grim thing that you do but it was like a, a, a kind of a special thing that maybe on feast days or on special occasions or perhaps to honor the person who died you would potentially take a drink from the skull and that would give you the power or it would honor the person who died so it's really super interesting um because um it's a it's it's a funny thing because 63 percent of you uh 92 of you have voted two of you are like uh yes no or maybe okay i'm gonna end the poll there um uh, uh Th two thirds of you say no i'm not going to drink from a human skull thank you very much um 38 percent of you third of you say yeah i drink from a human skull um i i don't know would i i think i would i think i would if it wasn't kind of disrespectful if um if you know my my, my friend had said oh you know i've spent ages tidying up this skull this strange human skull um or or it was a loved one then maybe it would be like a really treasured possession and uh it would be part of a, a kind of ritual because i think the other thing about archaeology and studying because i studied archaeology and anthropology as well one of the things that's really interesting is that when you look at other human cultures either people alive now in the world or people from the past a lot of the things they do sometimes seem a little bit unusual to you um or to me and then you think oh hang on a minute well what weird things do we do that they'd be like why do they do that that's very odd so it's always quite useful to think about um the things that we do that if an archaeologist was looking at us they'd be like what are they doing with that weird thing so um maybe we think drinking from human skulls is odd uh, a little bit unusual um but for them it would have been the most normal thing in the world okay two more things i want to show you so i'm going to show you um and these are both featured in my book uh, secret britain so the next one is a really cool site called must farm um and it's discovered it was in cambridgeshire and it was part it was the site of a quarry um that was being excavated and as soon as they got into the waterlogged area 
they started to discover amazing timbers, amazing preservation, intact pottery, animal bones. And the site has been dated to about 1000 BC to 900 BC. So just on the end of the Bronze Age, start of the Iron Age in prehistory. And what they've worked out is that this was actually a stilt village. They were houses built on stilts and they had like little wattle walkways between the houses, like little um, raised bridges between the houses. And underneath was the kind of the marshy river water. They don't know what happened here, which is what makes it one of the most fascinating recent discoveries in British archaeology. The timbers have been burned and the buildings have collapsed. So what you can see here are the radiating um, struts that held up um, the, the roof of one of these Iron Age, Bronze Age houses. And then when it started set on fire at a certain point, it collapsed in on itself and it all landed on the, the, the bottom of the river. And underneath this collapsed roof, they found intact pottery, they found tools, they found weapons, they found um, bundles of, of twine and, um, and cloth. And most of this stuff you never see because it's all rotted away. But in Must Farm, the preservation has been extraordinary. And if you go online, they've got really good resources for you to be able to see some video and photos of some of the artefacts that were discovered. And they're still working on them now. The thing about this is that it appears, the whole village appears to have burnt down and then been abandoned quite soon after it was built. And the thinking is that obviously fire would have been very devastating. Um, it would have destroyed your, your uh, they didn't find any human skeletons. So they don't think anyone was trapped in the buildings. No one died during the fire, but no one came back to try and retrieve their tools, their swords, their, their scythes, all the farming equipment. They didn't come back to come and get their kitchen utensils and pots. It's really interesting because they think, well, where did all the people go? And the answer is, we don't know. Were they chased away by another um, group in a, a neighbouring village? Did something terrible happen and they said, right, that's it, we're going to go? Or had they already left and they were leaving because of something that had happened and then they set fire to their own village? We don't know. The archaeology can tell us a lot, but it can't give us all the answers, which makes it pretty fascinating. And then finally, this is like a challenge for you guys, I guess. Some of you might recognise this. This is um, one of the Abilemno stones and it's from Aberdeenshire in Scotland. And on it are Pictish symbols. Um, this particular stone is called the Serpent Stone because can you see at the top, it's got that sort of snaky loop shape. So they're calling that a serpent. They say that's a snake. And then below it is a big kind of big zigzag with them with two um, joined circles. And that's called a Z rod. And then right at the bottom um, is a mirror shape, a sort of looking glass mirror, like an old fashioned fairy tale mirror. And just next to it is a kind of funny little rectangle. And um, that is a comb. So that's another type of Pictish symbol, which is the mirror and comb, and they tend to come together. Now we don't know what these symbols mean. They date from about the 500s to the early 600s AD. And they were probably used by Pictish kings, Pictish leaders, or elites, queens and kings, um, possibly as name, possibly as, as name plates, sort of big stone names. So we don't know what serpent, double disc and Zed rod and mirror and comb mean, because no one can work out the Pictish language completely. Um, and it doesn't feel like a complete language. There aren't enough symbols. But my challenge to you, is um, perhaps to, if you want to, if you want a kind of cool, um, a cool uh, challenge for the afternoon is, is go and have a look at some of the other Pictish symbols. And um, I mean, I don't think you'll solve the, the puzzle of what they say, but you might be able to be creative with, with something that was first established um, 1500 years ago, 1500 years ago, and you could write your own language. In, in Pictish symbols and attribute meaning to these different strange symbols and, uh, and perhaps write your own name headstone, which would be pretty cool. So um, I'm going to just go back to share screen. Oh, hello. 
So the last thing that I want to say is just that um, if you wanted to get a copy of Secret Britain, it's got um, 75 really cool artefacts and sites uh, around Britain. Uh, there's a special deal um, at the moment for you guys. Uh, so if you're a Yak, um, a Yak member, you get a Yak special and that um, is available. It's £18 and I'll sign a book and send you a message and uh, post it out and you can find the link on my website and it's also on the blog I think that um, Yak and the CBA have put up. So final final thing I was going to show you was the mandrake and I've just taken the page out and now I can't find it. Oh there you go. So last thing, let me come back to me. Hi. So mandrakes, you might know from Harry Potter, here's a real world, real life, genuine mandrake. So this one is in the uh, Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, but it was uh, handed in by a farm labourer in 1916. And it turns out that it's not actually a mandrake, which are those roots that appear to be alive, like little people. Look, it does look like a dolly, doesn't it? Um, this is actually a bryony root, but the man who owned it thought it was a mandrake and he thought that it would keep him safe in his house. So he used to wrap it up and put it on the windowsill as like a little magical talisman to keep him safe. And then he realised that it was an unusual historical artefact and so he handed it into the museum. Isn't that cool? So archaeology can sometimes be from the Ice Age and it can also be from 1916 in Oxfordshire and uh, it continues to... to develop and there are so many cool things to explore and I'm really excited that you guys are, um, are, are part of the, the next generation whether you go into archaeology professionally whether it's just a cool hobby and a way of, of exploring the past and where you live and and how culture works um, I, I think it's really awesome and it's been really really fun talking to you this morning thank you Thank you, Marianne. That was fantastic. I was I've really left no time for questions. I'm so sorry, guys. I chunted on a bit, didn't I? We do have some questions. Um, if people want to hang around for 10 minutes or so. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it quick. Um, go, go, go. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so we'll start with Evie. So Evie asks, what got you into archaeology and when did you first start? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I watched a TV documentary when I was about 13, I think. And it was about archaeologists who climbed a mountain in South America and they discovered an Incan ice mummy. So this body that had been um, naturally preserved in the ice. And they did all the excavation and the analysis. And, um, and she was like a child who'd been sacrificed on the top of a mountain. I thought that's amazing because those people, they weren't doing that to be mean and horrible. They were doing that as a sort of great honor to the gods. How on earth do you get to climb up mountains and discover the, the kind of really unusual ways that other people see the world? And the answer was um, study archeology. span Yeah. So I did. <laughs> Weirdly, mine was Time Team. Ah, <laughs> yeah, also watching Time Team, yeah. yeah. Yeah, growing up watching Time Team, and then I got to be on Time Team, which was totally a Very dream. Cool. Yeah. yeah, super cool. Yeah. Um, Beatrice asks, "What has been your most exciting archaeologist find or archaeological find, um, and do you like writing?" Oh, two good questions. Um, so, so honestly, that funny little Roman bone pin is not going to rewrite the history books or the archaeological textbooks, but it was so exciting because. I found it and I wasn't expecting to find anything in my muddy ditch mm -hmm. and I don't think to be honest the site um the site uh, director thought we were going to find anything in the in the muddy ditch but then I found my pin and Mike next door found this big pot and um it was it was truly thrilling because I thought the last time someone's held this pin in their hand is what 1800 years ago when someone had it in their hair, like, look, I've got a hairpin in my hair now. Mine's made of, there, look, it's all twisted. Mine's made of metal, and it was probably a lady or a girl who had that pin in her hair, and maybe she was going to the ditch to throw the old bit of pot away, and then it fell out of her, and she went, oh, where's that hairpin gone? <laughs> and then I'm the next person to hold it, 1,800 or so years ago. I mean, that is pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Um, what else? Oh, do I like writing? Um, I sometimes get a bit lonely, but I do really like talking to people about the things that I write about. So mostly yes. Once it's written. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Daniel wanted to know um, what the buildings behind you in Petra were. They're, they're temples, aren't they? Yes. So I'm going to, I didn't, isn't that terrible? I still can't remember the dates of Petra. Ugh. Um, <laughs> help me. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Who built Petra? Give me a date. Um, okay, so about 150 BC, and it was a, a city um, uh, built by the Nabataeans. And so they were people who were living in this area, great traders. So they had huge trading networks right across um, uh, from Greece on one side, right across to what is now Iran, sort of Persia on the other side. Um, so about 150 BC. There you wow. go. Um, we've got two very similar questions. Okay. Um, what is the weirdest, most bizarre or strangest thing that you found? Oh, okay. So I didn't find them, but I got to obviously make the TV programme for Mystic Britain about that weird pit of bones in Warren Percy. I mean, that, that was pretty odd because when you're talking to, um, you know, sensible professional archaeologists and scientists, and they're like, we think it's because they thought they were zombies. <laughs> like, really? Are we... Is that definitely true? That sounds a bit far-fetched, but that is genuinely like they thought they were revenants and that they were going to come back and haunt them because their spirits were unsettled. And so they, they kind of like cut their bones up and, you know, put Just to make sure. them in a fire. Yeah, it was a bit weird. Pretty weird. Um, you also find really super weird um, uh, sort of burials in the, from the Iron Age as well where people are kind of buried in ditches or they have their uh, Roman burials as well, where they've, after someone has died of natural causes or whatever, they cut their head off and they put their head somewhere else, just in case, so they don't come back and cause trouble. I believe, uh, really I believe Claire actually um, found a, a body that was like that, where the head had been, been tipped up. <sighs> so, so obviously not laid flat, but the, the head was sort of skull up and then the, then the skeleton. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's really awesome that because we're all archaeologists, we can just like really geek out on gruesome, gruesome things and go, wow. So what they did was they took their head and they turned it upside down. They put it on their bombs and then buried them. And you go, that's that's a good day at the office. That that's science. <laughs> that's chat in the camp afterwards. <laughs> yeah. um, on the point of schools, uh, Zara asked, wasn't one of the romantic poets most famous accessory a mug made of a skull? Oh, was it Byron or something? Byron, yeah. They were all pretty weird, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. And the guy who um excavated uh Paviland Cave, which is where the earliest human burial was discovered, which is in uh, Gower in South Wales. Um, he apparently had a table that had petrified um, poos, so corporalites, like embedded into it, sort of like a, a weird mosaic, a poo table. <laughs> weird. Archaeologists are quite odd sometimes, but, you yeah. know, in a really, really yeah. fun way. <laughs> in a pooey way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we also... Hopefully not uh, coprolite related. What's the largest thing you found? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not coprolite related. The largest thing. So I'm not a field archaeologist, so I often don't actually do the finding. Um, it's, it's, you know, I'm standing next to people who, who do the finding. Um, the largest thing I've ever found. I went on an amazing kind of trip, basically. I, I went, I took myself on holiday to go to the Priscelli Mountains in Wales, uh, hills in, in South Wales, West Wales, where the blue stones from Stonehenge um, were quarried from. Yeah. And I, I just, I went walking for the weekend um, with my family and we went and looked at these blue stone outcrops and they're quite dramatic. They stick out. That's it actually in the book too. Let me see if I can find a picture of it quickly. Um, and that's pretty cool. Uh, so that's one of them. So this is Khan Goy dog, 
and these Priscelli Mountains, they're, really, they're hills, they're really beautiful. It's, it's such a beautiful place. And, um, and we don't know quite, it's, the, the blue stones are an unusual sort of phenomenon because there's always been that debate about how they got to Stonehenge, which is about 150 miles away. Um, but also a lot of the blue stones have marks on them, which suggest that they were part of some kind of monument before they were ever at Stonehenge. So they look like they've been fit together or some of them have mortise and tenon joints where, where they've got a sticky uppy bit that could have a lintel stone on top. But we don't know that there's no evidence that they were ever in that kind of an arrangement in Stonehenge. So the thinking is, well, maybe they were in some other monument first and then brought to Stonehenge. And if so, where? Was it in Wales or was it in Wiltshire or was it somewhere in between? So it was kind of magical because it is an archaeological site, but also it's just a really cool wild place. And um, it felt like it felt like a big discovery because I was staring at a really, really big pile of rocks going, <laughs> these could have been some of the other blue stones that they had planned to bring to Stonehenge. In some places, there's, there's a blue stone that has been quarried out, but then left there. So it's sort of just sitting there waiting, but it's been waiting for, you know, 5,000 years and it's going to wait 5,000 more, I reckon. Oh, yeah, you're not moving it. No, I'm not going to move it. <laughs> they, um, I always like sites like that where you can almost imagine um, standing in someone's footsteps that they haven't changed in thousands of years and that you're looking at the same view that somebody did millennia ago yeah absolutely and and you don't need to go to wild west wales to do that if you're walking down a, a footpath and and you feel that the sides of the the grassy banks are rising up either side of you you might be in an ancient holloway you know which has been used as a track by people for hundreds if not maybe thousands of years and and you are absolutely in the footsteps of the ancestors yeah. and i think there's a lot to be said for sort of trying to make your own neolithic pot and working out what what marks a shell makes in in wet clay or how would you um cultivate this field how much effort would it take to take all the stones out to build that dry stone wall all those kind of landscape things they, they do inform us, don't they? They help us understand because people in the past were people. I mean, they're not like us. We didn't have smartphones and, you know, waterproof <laughs> raincoats, um, but they, they ha were still tackling the same problems. And so I think it's always useful to sign, put yourself in their shoes and go, well, what would I do? Yeah. Or how, how does it feel when I walk on this route or stand at the top of this summit or go into this tomb or what have you? Oh, Elsie's just asked an interesting question. Could they have moved the blue stones from one area to combine with the Stonehenge to amalgamate two tribes? A really good question. A really good question. And they're doing ancient DNA analysis of some of the cremated remains that have been found at Stonehenge. And they found that a lot of those people grew up, you can do isotope analysis from your, your bones and teeth. Um, and it gives you an idea of what kind of geology, what kind of land you were growing up on. And so it seems pretty clear that some of the people who are buried at Stonehenge grew up in West Wales, probably from a similar area to where the blue stones were quarried from. So it may well be some kind of ongoing connection. It's not that the people at Stonehenge bought the stones from West Wales because they were like, oh, we hear you've got some high, uh, we hear you've got some really good blue stones and we need some for our monument. So could you just send them over? Oh, yeah, the shipping yeah, uh, and delivery on Wednesday. Great, thanks. It wasn't that. It may well have been two groups or two communities who were connected in lots of ways. And one of the ways they were connected was that people were moving. Maybe people were getting married between the different tribes, but also they were building a monument together or sharing some kind of sacred um world view wow. yeah we've got good though. so many again so many unanswered questions stonehenge has been studied and studied and studied but the more we study it the more questions are raised so yeah we're never going to run out of questions about stonehenge keep thinking about your ideas though and and what you think because investigating those is how we come up with new answers Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not repeating what other people have thought, but going, hmm, OK, that's interesting. Have we thought about this evidence? What about that? 
Um, and as scientific um, techniques develop, um, as you guys grow up, um, more things will be able to be discovered from the artefacts that we've already excavated and from the landscapes that we already know about, as well as identifying and detecting new ones. Yeah. So, um, yeah, back in the day, they didn't think they'd be able to do any analysis of, of cremated bone because they thought the cremation fires when people were, 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 were cremated would have destroyed all the useful information. But now we can do DNA profiling and we can do isotope analysis and all sorts of cool stuff from tiny, tiny little bits of bone now. Yeah. Yeah. Fab. Yeah. I, that might be everything. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Sorry to keep you guys uh, waiting. Uh, waiting? Waiting for your lunch, I guess. <laughs> um. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really, really fun. Um, yeah, so if you want to get a copy of uh, Secret Britain, uh, if you go to my website or um, uh, on the YAC blog, there's a link. Uh, so you guys get a special price and, and free postage and packaging. So it's out on the 29th of September and um, it's cool. I like it. I mean, I know it's my book, but it's got really good pictures and hopefully I've written like interesting things about it. Oh, there's the Dagenham Idol. That's a cool, weird thing. Look. Ooh, they found it in the River Thames. Weird, right? Um, all sorts of cool stuff. So, yeah, if you fancy getting a hold of it or, you know, good Christmas present, but um, or find it in your library or, yeah. Yeah, there's a link to it on the uh, Yak site um, and on the topic of making pots and testing out your ways of doing it on the Yak site, we've got lots of things to do and resources and uh, you can make poo. Which is oh, of, how do you make poo? Uh, with lots of slimy ingredients. Lovely. Uh, have a look. Take a okay, look. Okay, brilliant. So if you do, if you're feeling creative this afternoon, or you want something to do, take a look and yeah, get yeah. Cracking. I'm gonna put um, I'm gonna put the link uh up here as well. There you go. So that's the link for the book. Um, yeah, or or uh, make up your own Pictish symbols. So if yes. you Google um uh pictish abalemno stones and the pictish symbols then you yeah. can work out you can decide that you want to be a serpent zed rod double disc um chicken chicken i like it marianne that's how you yeah. write marianne obviously <laughs> thank you thank you marianne thank you everyone that attended amazing guys thanks so much for coming uh all the best and uh, see you soon bye bye